I want to wish all the moms in the room today happy Mother's Day. We have such a, an all-star group of moms. Isn't that true? Woo! Uh, mothers and grandmothers, I know some of you maybe are here with your family today. What a joy it is to, to come as a family and to, to worship together, but also to maybe go have breakfast or a meal or spend the day together. And so I'm excited for you in that. And uh, today we're going to be continuing in our series, Reclaiming Heaven. And if you've been with us the last uh, several weeks, we've been talking about this, this task we have before us, which is to reclaim the truth of what heaven is, as opposed to maybe the distortions that have happened in our culture, or the ways that we believe about heaven that have nothing to do with what scripture tells us. And today we're going to hit on something that is painstakingly practical for every single one of us, and that is heresies of heaven, things not to say When someone dies, okay, heresies of heaven. I hear a chuckle, a little bit of awkwardness. It's because every single one of us, at one point or another, comes across people who have experienced loss, have experienced death. It could be that you're at a memorial and you come across a family or or an individual who's lost a loved one. You're there to celebrate their, their lost loved one's life, but you're encountering them in that moment. Could be with a coworker who has, has had a death in the family. Could be with uh, someone you know who's lost a child. It could also be with someone who's just announced that they have a terminal illness. And you are in this moment where you feel compelled to offer comfort. To say something in the midst of their grief and their pain. And the world says, get away from pain, because the world doesn't know how to do grief, doesn't know how, is awkward and, and it's uncomfortable. And the world says, just get away from that. But we know, as God's people, we can't run from that. We want to enter in, but we just don't have the words to say. So we stumble, and we reach, and then we say it. And we wish we didn't say it. Today, I want to talk about seven things we tend to say and three things we should say. It's a top 10 list, and we're going we're gonna to look at what are the things that we should be considering and thinking about in some of the truisms and trite statements that often people resort to when they encounter someone who's experienced loss. It's a very practical message today, and this is my deal, if I can get your attention, is that if you focus in for 20 minutes, you're going to learn some things, you'll get some tools in your tool chest that will serve you well the rest of your life, and when you come across those moments of discomfort, You will be equipped, and you will be ready if you focus in for 20 minutes. If not, you'll have egg on your face the rest of your life. So this is really important, okay? So focus in. The Proverbs are a gift to us, and there's a proverb that stands out for for us today. And I want to have us look at these brief but powerful words from Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. And I want you to read these with me in loud, full voice. Let us read together. The words of the reckless pierce like swords. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Okay, let's go back. Let's say it again. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Let's just keep that on the screen for a moment. When someone is grieving, it's like an open wound. And this image here in this passage, this proverb, is vivid. Reckless thoughtless words are like stabbing someone. It is piercing them like a knife or a sword. That's what reckless words do in certain moments of life. But there's a wisdom to those who are sensitive to the needs of others, wisdom to those who walk with God, that actually brings healing. That in these moments of loss that people encounter, we can act like the reckless and pierce and heap on many more burdens and wounds onto those who are grieving, or we can be healers. But it takes uh, some thoughtfulness. It takes some intentionality to be a healer as opposed to resorting to some of the popular sayings that often paint a picture of God and of heaven as something altogether unattractive. In fact, it distorts God in some of these sayings, many of which happen in the church. And I've heard someone say in this church that grieving the loss of a loved one in a large church like this one can often result in death by paper cuts. Little piercings. 
little words of saying, uh, uh, popular sayings that are meant to be offering comfort, but they actually do harm and they bring pain. How is that? Maybe it's because we haven't talked about it and we need to talk about it, okay? I want to put us all on equal footing, though, because I don't want to make it seem like uh, I am the bearer of all wisdom when it comes to what to say and what not to say, because the reality is a lot of these sayings I've learned because of my own experience with them and uttering them myself. First time I remember was when I worked at my first church I ever worked at was First Presbyterian of Yakima. And I had an internship that gave me a lot of uh, exposure to different kinds of ministries, but one of them was to visit jails and to go on hospital visits. And there was one particular family that I got a chance to visit. It was a woman named Judy Kelly, and Judy was suffering from cancer. She was battling cancer. And I had seen her at church, and she, she uh, was really seemed to be on the outside managing well, but I didn't know her story. And I made some assumptions about how she was doing. And then I was called on to go visit her at the hospital. So I go to Yakima Memorial Hospital. I, I go uh, into the, the building, find out where her room is. I go up to her room, and I walk in the door. And I was unprepared for what I was going to see. I was unprepared to see someone who had had rapid weight loss, sunken cheeks, and was close to death. And in being unprepared, I didn't know how to encounter Judy's husband, Bill, who had just come to the door as I did. And there were words that came out of my mouth because I was reckless And I hadn't thought through what this scene would look like. And I really hadn't thought much about Bill. And this is what I said. Bill, I wasn't prepared to see her like this. This is really hard for me. Here is a woman in the center of trauma and chaos and despair, battling for her life. And her husband, who is there trying to provide for her, but also suffering his own grief. And who am I talking about in my first response? Me. And yet that's also one of the most common things that people experience in hospitals or in, in care situations where they, they utter out loud these feelings. And it was like, I said these words and I, like, I wanted to gather them back up and put them back in my mouth. It's like, but they're already out there, right? And I could see it immediately in his face. I could read Bill's face. Here's someone from the church, someone he knew, who was hoping that I would bring a word of hope, maybe a word of encouragement. And instead, my words were reckless, and they pierced like a sword. I didn't give the kind of healing and comfort that he needed. Instead, it added to the heartache he was feeling as he watched his wife die. So today, this is what I want to do. We're just going to do something that is painstakingly practical. I want you to open your bulletin, and there's a little list of ten things that I want you to write down. And this will serve you well the rest of your life. We're going to talk about seven things not to say and three things to say. And if we have time, I'm going to give you a bonus one for number 11, okay? If we have time. So uh, we better be quick about this, right? I'm going to begin with heresy number one. This is the big dog. This is the one that drives me bonkers. If you ever say this in my presence, I'm going to give you the stink eye. It's this trite, unbiblical statement that distorts God's character in heaven. And it is these four words. God needed another angel. How many of you have heard this saying or at least are familiar with it? Someone has said it. Yeah, a lot of you. Most of you, okay? God needed another angel. We, uh, and some of you know a story of an encounter I had with a, a family uh, outside of our church, but it was ministered to by this congregation because they had lost their baby girl to sudden infant death syndrome. And she, this family didn't know much about God, but one of her friends, who in fact was a Christian, said these words to her, you know what, honey, God just needed another angel. To which, <laughs> in her snarky personality, and I wanted to hug her because it was so perfect, she said, you know what? If that's true, then why didn't God take your kid? And in her response, she exposed the problem of this statement. Okay? Not only is this statement theologically wrong, people don't turn into angels when they die. They remain people. But the more damaging assumption from this comment is that God is somehow 
uh, involved in taking children from their parents. What does that say about the character of God? That God gives us our children? I mean, we, we can, as, as moms in this room, you know that, that we, we have this part to play. Men do too, of course, I'm sorry. Uh, we won't get into that awkward. But, uh, but, but men and women, you know, they, they come together and, and then there's a physical formation of a child. But there's something about the soul of your child that you had nothing to do with, right? And so the idea that, that God has given this child to us, this, the soul and personality of a child, and then because God's lonely, he needed to take the kid back. Gosh, that's, that's hard to reconcile. Even people who don't know anything about Christian faith or about God would struggle to reconcile with that. We've talked about in this series the problem of bifurcating heaven and earth as these two distinctly different things, but instead, instead talked about how God is present here, how heaven and earth are married and wedded together, and Jesus has brought the kingdom of God, and it is coming, and it is here. And we are learning how to taste and to see this kingdom that's in our midst, that God is present with us. Okay? This means God doesn't need another angel because he's lonely. God is with us and present with us now. The Spirit of God indwells in this place, in this world, now. So this is a heresy. This is, this is not at all true to the story of Scripture. People do not become angels. Okay? Children also weren't meant to die. That is not God's will or way. The, the reality is that children reflect the image of God. And God longs for us to know life and life to the full, but we have a broken, sinful world. And that's when death comes. So, when people are in this moment of need, especially those who've lost a child, this is not something we want to say, right? It betrays what we believe about God and believe about heaven. And if you say it, you're going to get the stink eye. Okay. Okay, number two. Number two. Maybe some of you can start guessing some of these as we go along, what I'm going to fill in. The second one, I'm going to do quickly... It's for the best. Anybody heard this one before? It's for the best? Yeah. This is, a, this is uh, an interesting one because in some ways you wanted to say, it's for the best for who? Right? Just like uh, the previous statement that people give, often this is given out of an attempt to bring comfort, but it's a distortion of loss, and it misunderstands the character of God. What's best is for us to be with each other and to be whole and to be at peace. Okay? I understand that there's attempts to bring comfort here, but we'll talk about how that, that attempt to bring comfort is distorted in just a bit. Number three is this. She's in a better place. Or he's in a better place. Anybody heard this one? Anybody? Yep. This is an interesting one. We were talking as a staff this week, and this is where the list was generated, was some of our staff teams that do a lot of care work and... Uh, there's this beautiful picture that one of our staff members shared with me from Proverbs 25, 20, and it says this. Like one who takes away a garment on a cold day, or like vinegar poured on soda, is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. One who tries to sing songs to a heavy heart. There may be some things that have partial truths or whole truths, but in the moment, they bring pain. You know, we know that in this series, we've talked about how we were created for this place. We were created for earth. We are earth-dwelling people. And our purpose and our eternity and our resurrection is going to be here in this place. And often when someone says this kind of statement, they're trying to point towards the fact that, you know what, your loved one, your, this woman or this man... Uh, this child is, is with God in a better place. But God has actually said, no, the better place is coming. That's the urging we have for heaven and earth to come and to make this world new again. We were made for here. And so, it's fine to believe this, that there's a better place, especially if someone has suffered over a long period of time uh, or suffered through a disease. But it's not something we want to share with someone in the moment because it's difficult to bring together. Okay? Uh, this sort of statement also, by the way, uh, has a problem in that it tends to be, it tends to, to, to uh, invite advice afterwards. She's in a better place, so you should be comforted, so you should feel better. Okay? 
And that's a desire that all of us have that all together doesn't work. We cannot fix someone else's grief. We cannot fix someone else's grief. You've got to be careful because statements like this only lead to more grief, which is why you want to stay away from things like, and words like, you should hear what happened to me. Right? That's a sort, sort of like inviting my story. It's about me. Or here's what I would do, which are advice giving. And that's not helpful for someone who is in grief. If you're tempted to give advice, don't. That's a key word uh, for people who are experiencing loss. So that's number three. Number four, this is God's will. Anybody heard this one before? Yep. This is God's will. It's a close cousin to there's a reason for everything. Uh, and uh, his sister, God is in control, right? These statements that people say. A good axiom that I uh, feel like we, we all could live by is to never say something you wouldn't say to a parent who has just lost a child. Okay. Never say something that, that tries to describe the character of God if you wouldn't say it to a parent who's just lost a child. To say that this is God's will implies that God did this to them. And God doesn't kill people. God doesn't kill children. That's not his will. Can God bring good out of awful circumstances? Can he bring good out of hurt and loss? Yes. But that is something altogether different than saying this is God's will. And I know that there are conversations about uh, theodicy and how suffering works in the life of someone, but this isn't the time to get into it. It is singing songs to a heavy heart. Okay, that's number four. Number five, with time you will move on. And it's close partner, time will heal all wounds. Right? Time heals all wounds. Right? Oh, honey, you'll get over this. Time heals all wounds. This is a common saying that is terribly destructive for those who are in the midst of the tunnel of chaos and grief and loss. It's well-meaning, but the only time that this particular phrase works is, I think, when there's a little bit of distance from loss and maybe you're someone who's had similar experience, but even then I would caution it. We had a staff member uh, in a meeting earlier this week who shared about how there was a point a little while after her husband had died and she had just uh, come to UPPC to, to work here. And it was a point in time where another widow came up to her and she said a, a version of this, but much more sensitive and I think more beautiful. She put her arm around her and said, for what it's worth, it will get better. For what it's worth, it will get better. And she was in a unique position to share that kind of insight into a person who had lost their husband as a fellow widower. But she was in the unique, maybe the only position to offer such a word. Okay. We want to be careful of, of these kinds of trite sayings that betray someone's grief when they're in the midst of it. And it discounts their very present, real feelings in the present. Because the reality is, if you're in the midst of grief and you've lost someone dear to you, you feel like you're drowning and you wouldn't tell somebody who's drowning, it'll get better when you're back on land, right? It'll get better, I promise. You're gasping for air right now, but it'll get better, right? Better to actually be physically present with them, which we'll talk about in just a moment. All right, number six. Oh, this one is just, it's slap worthy, right? And I know this is common for some people to share this, but we've got to be cautious. Number six is God won't give you more than you can handle. God won't give you more than you can handle. I was with a, a family that's not a part of our congregation but has a connection with UPPC a while back, and we were planning the memorial for their 30-year-old son who had just committed suicide. And they were in the tunnel of chaos. They were trying to understand really what is incomprehensible, the idea of their son who had taken his life. And there was a woman who was a friend of the family who was there with them, and at the end of our time together, she felt it necessary just to drop this bomb and just to say, hey, guys, remember, God won't give you more than you can handle. 
And this is the deal. I mean, I ended up talking with her afterwards, but, you know, I wanted just to, just, just to say, how do you know that? Is that in the Bible? Or is that just a bumper sticker? And everything I know about God, two things are absolutely clear. First, God does not give tragedy, so he's not giving you something that you're supposed to handle. So if you're not handling it, then you should feel bad about yourself. But, and I, I realize, again, there's a nuanced perspective on theodicy that some of you might want to get into, but it is not the time. That's for theological discussions at round tables, you know, in other places. But God does not give tragedy to people. That's the first thing I know. And the second thing is that loss and grief are often things people can't handle. They can't handle it. In fact, it's because they can't handle it and they need to be invited to the fact that they can't handle it that we're drawn closer to our need for God and for dependency. This is a statement that I think actually drives people away from God as if they're supposed to shoulder things all by themselves. It betrays the very, the very nature of Christian community and what heaven will be when we're in community together. The reality is life gives you things you cannot handle, which is why we need each other. Amen? That's why we need community. Maybe you're here today and you're here because something's going on in your heart. You've had a loss, a change, something difficult in your, in your life. And you realize that I'm here because I need people. I can't handle it by myself. Right? Then a gift that God gives us is his presence through other people. And if they are faithful and wise, that they can offer words of comfort and hope. And what does the proverb tell us? healing, that we can heal each other with our words in our presence, okay? That's number six. Now, number seven, I'm going to close with this, and then we're going to get to some of the encouraging stuff. Number seven is, I know exactly how you feel. I know exactly how you feel. I remember, I remember we were talking about this last night. I don't know how it came up at dinner, but we were celebrating my son Luke's 12th birthday at uh, Old Spaghetti Factory and just came to the conversation again about my brother Doug, who I've mentioned several times in this series. And we were flying back from Philadelphia after he had died and we'd, we'd had his memorial service. And we came back to church here. And I remember one uh, uh, person who in particular came up and, and said this, I know exactly how you feel. And, you know, if I'm honest and I was just human and not, uh, maybe as grace giving as I wanted to in that moment, what I wanted to say was, "No, you don't. You don't know. How, you don't know how I feel at all. If you lost your brother, that's your brother, not mine. You didn't lose my brother. You didn't lose my dad. You didn't lose my spouse. You didn't have that cancer. You didn't have the same experience of my cancer. Whatever that may be, in our lot, in our lives, we don't know how other people feel." We can imagine, but we've got to be careful with this sort of statement that often belittles or demeans someone's individual particular situation. And we want to be empathetic and sympathize and try to understand the nuances because every person is different and every relationship is different, right? Right? So to be sensitive and wise means to say, I don't know at all how you feel. And then to say some words of comfort, which we'll get to in just a few moments, that, that do communicate love and grace and healing. Okay? This is obviously a statement that many of us know that after this is said, advice is given. I know exactly how you feel, so you know what? You should do this. Or I would encourage you to do this. Again, real advice is never helpful unless it's asked for. Unless it's asked for. Now, I want to give three things to say. These are some pieces of wisdom for you when you're with people who have experienced loss. But first, I want, to, I want to show you something that has served me so well over my years of ministry. And it's this uh, circle right here. Many of you are thinking, going, What's, are we going to play darts after the service? Um, this is a, 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 an image and a theory that was given by a woman named Susan Sink. And she's a clinical psychologist. And she tells a story. I mentioned her story in the, uh, in the email blast on Wednesday about her own battle with cancer. But she talks about how, how often we misunderstand how to use words and what words to use. And so she, uh, she encourages us to do this. And this is how the, the circle works. You draw a circle. And maybe if you're in your bulletin, you want to do this. 
Maybe take your bullets and take a pen, draw it. And in the middle of the circle is the person who is experiencing trauma. Okay? This is, this is the extent of my artistic skills. Okay, you can clap. It's fine. Yeah. Thank you. That was awkward. I thought you'd be impressed. Okay. In the story, by the way, that I mentioned when I, when I, I didn't say the right thing with uh, Judy. Judy is the person in the center. Why? Because she is the one that's battling cancer and facing her own mortality. She's in the center. And the thing about being in the center is that she can say and she can do anything she wants to do. Okay? That's the benefit of being in the center of the trauma. That's the one benefit. Okay? Now, outside that circle, you draw another person. And this is, in this case, it's going to be her husband. Right? It's going to be Bill. And he is the next person in the circle. And then you draw maybe uh, uh, children and extended family, and maybe close friends. You just make that circle wider and wider. Okay? So this, in the situation, let's imagine, the rings get wider and wider based on who's encountering loss. And in this case, this was me. Okay? And the rule of thumb is that wherever you're at in this ring, you can dump... Words of anxiety, words of fear, words of frustration, words of of angst and pain, but it has to be outside the ring that you stand in. And the principle that Sink talks about is that comfort always goes in. So words of comfort always go in, and words of anxiety or your own needs always go out. She says, dump out. You guys see that? And so in the situation that I found myself in the hospital, what did I do? I reversed them. I had anxiety. I had feelings that I dumped to Bill. And I had plenty of people outside my rings. I had colleagues. I had family I had people that I could speak with about my own experience of being in that setting and how painful it was for me to watch my friend and uh, part of our congregation suffer as she did. But the problem is I went in with that dumping. Comfort in, dump out. Pretty simple, right? And often what this exposes is that when we experience someone's loss, it is uncomfortable. It is awkward. And we don't know what to do with it. And so we think we should say those words of discomfort and awkwardness in, but it doesn't heal. Instead, we should say something different. And I want to talk about that right now. Is we should offer words that are healing, that are helpful, and that communicate that healing presence of God when we're in their midst. Okay, here here they are. Three things. The first one is this. Very simple. I love you. Or if you can't say that, some people feel awkward saying, I love you, is just to say, you are loved. You are loved. You know, often when you're in the midst of the center of chaos and you're in this middle ring, or maybe you're close to the middle ring as a spouse or a close loved one, you kind of forget that people love you. You forget that people are are with you and present with you, and so you need that affirmation and that comfort that you're loved. One of the most powerful things you can say is just know, You are so loved. Second thing, it's a piece of wisdom that I would share with you to say is, are these words, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry this has happened. I'm so sorry that you're experiencing the pain that you're experiencing. Notice it's not followed with, I'm so sorry, but, or I'm so sorry, and, just, I'm so sorry. And to leave it at that. They know it's awkward. Everything about their situation is awkward. When you're in a hospital room, in a hospital bed, or when you're at home on hospice, or you're having to be surrounded by loved ones in your final days, they know it's awkward. When you're going through chemotherapy, because this works not just for loss and death, it works for anyone who's experiencing difficult times. They know it's awkward. Accept the awkwardness, right? Embrace the awkwardness is just to say these words and be done with it, okay? Okay? So that's the second thing is to say, I'm so sorry. And the third one, you are not alone. You're not alone. Sometimes you might even be said, I, I don't know what to say, 
but I just wanted you to know that you're not alone. And I'm here. And I love you. And I'm so sorry. Last one, I'll give you a length, or uh, eleventh one, a freebie, and that's maybe not something that you say, but something that you are, and that is to say nothing at all. Some of the most powerful witnesses of, of presence with people when they're mourning loss and they're working through grief is when people would gather around them and they wouldn't say anything at all. They would just be ready and available and waiting. I talked with a woman after the first service, and I'll just end with this, where she said that she can articulate after the loss of her husband and then her dad and then her mom, all within a six-month period, she can articulate every time someone said one of those three things, but particularly the fourth one, that when people gathered around, and they didn't feel any need whatsoever to speak words. We have a gift in our church in that we have Stephen's ministers, and I want to close with this. Uh, we have Stephen's ministers, people in our church, who are trained to care and to counsel and give love and words of comfort in the midst of loss. They're dear people, and I want you to always know that those are available to you uh, as a member of this church to, to draw on and to be encouraged by their counsel and their presence. And this is a wonderful ministry. And if you feel like you're led to something where you would offer comfort in to those people who are experiencing their darkest days, you may be called to that sort of ministry, and I'd love to talk with you about it. But overall, I want all of us to be the kinds of people that not only in our church resist the temptation for the million paper cuts of sayings that hurt or pierce like knives, but instead that we offer healing not only to those in our midst, in our community, but healing to those outside of our walls, in your workplace, and in your neighborhood, and in your spheres of influence, that we would be the love of Jesus in that way. I want to pray for you and pray for this, uh, these tools that will be put them to, to good use. And so will you bow your head with me and let us pray. Lord heaven, I'm so glad and thankful for those who bring healing words to our lives when we need them most. Lord, thank you for the Stevens ministers and the deacons in our church whose ministry is so powerfully used in being present with people in the midst of loss. And we want to also be caregivers and comforters ourselves, to bring healing in the moments where loss has come, where death has come, or where suffering is present. Lord, would you help us to be wiser in our use of words, that we would embody in the flesh your hands and feet, your very presence to those who need your touch and need words of comfort. Lord, would you use us as a church to be that kind of witness, we pray. And we ask this in your name, the holy name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen, amen.